All right, so we're going to cover Chapter 11, Equipment Design for Radiation Protection. So this should be a little bit more interesting to you because it actually applies to you on more of a daily basis. Things you can actually see and understand a little bit. That tapping in the background you hear is the dog walking around, so don't be alarmed by that. So state-of-the-art equipment is used to optimize images and reduce radiation dose. If you have this equipment, this is not state-of-the-art. This is very ancient equipment. Manufactured with radiation safety features to meet federal regulations. Um, accessories can also reduce dose. So with this, um, federal regulations. So federal regulations and guidelines now kind of regulate what type of x-ray machine you can have, what it should do, its uh, output in terms of KVP, um, amount of exposure, leakage radiation, all that stuff is just uh, regulated by the government now. Every diagnostic imaging system must have a protected tube housing and a correctly functioning control panel. So your control panel can't be all beat up, missing lights, buttons, all that stuff. Um, it should have preset techniques for the most part, uh, maybe not perfect for each particular patient because of different uh, patient habitat, but you can um, set up certain techniques that are close to the average of what you would get for most of your patients. Lead line metal diagnostic type protective tube housing is required to protect patient and imaging personnel from off focus or leakage radiation. So you have a certain amount of leakage radiation that comes from the tube um, in all different directions. It can leak out in any particular seam or area. Uh, most of it is focused so that it comes out the bottom through the shutters um, with the collimator in place. Um, even though it is lead line, there is still some amount of leakage radiation involved. Um, that leakage radiation cannot um, exceed 100 mR per hour when it's measured a meter from the x-ray source. So basically the source being the tube. Uh, there are several radiation survey instruments that you can use to kind of measure that off. And a lot of the engineers at certain hospitals will have that particular equipment and be able to just check it from time to time. Control panel must be behind a suitable protective barrier so it's generally outside the window um, of the room. Um, we don't want the personnel to get any more unnecessary exposure than they have to. Uh, must indicate conditions of exposure so you must be able to say what the KVP and what the mass is. Audible tone upon exposure so there needs to be some audible tone that lets you know that an exposure was made. A lot of the newer equipment will have a visual um, tone as well or visual representation of usually an x-ray symbol somewhere on here that will light up when the exposure is actually made. So you should be listening for the audio clue as well as looking for the visual clue on that. The table must be strong, provide adequate support, it must be uniform. By uniform I mean it must be the same all the way from one end to the other. There shouldn't be like more uh, material in the middle and then less and then more and then going back and forth on that. It's mostly carbon fiber. Floating tabletop is preferred. You don't see any fixed table units anymore just because of the amount of movement the patient would have to make as well as the um, x-ray techs would have to drag around those patients on top of those tables. Um, so you don't see them quite as often or ever in a lot of uh, places. You may see some if you work in a more rural destination or some really, really old schools do have some of the fixed units still. Uh, source to image receptor distance indicator. This is basically the measuring tape. This is used to ensure the correct SID um, because obviously the SID makes a difference in what kind of technique you're going to select. Distance accuracy must be within 2%. So if the tape measure broke off after a foot, that is not within 2%. You cannot use that as a general guideline for your SID. Uh, lasers are commonly used for the centering, so you usually have a centering light as well as the collimating light. Limitation devices. So the collimator is the most widely used to restrict the useful beam. Um, generally with the collimator here, you'll have the shutters that will close this um, field size down. Aperture diaphragms we'll get into in just a minute. Cones and cylinders. Those basically can be attached to the bottom of this collimator housing and kind of uh, focus this radiation down into like usually a circle or sometimes a tight square depending on what type of uh, cone it is. All basically reduce the scatter radiation so you won't have so much of this off focus radiation going off to the side. Everything will be narrowed and kind of redirected to a focus point uh, towards the middle of the light field. Coincidence, physical size and alignment must be within 2%. So when you look at the actual light field, 
that's on the table and you look at the um, shutters that should be within two percent so what you visually see should be your output on your final image so if the light field is really big but it ends up being like instead of a 14 by 17 like a 10 by 12 instead then you don't have good coincidence between the shutters and the actual um, IR field size. Positive beam limitation consists of electronic sensors and an image receptor holder that sends signals to the collimator housing. So what that basically means is that there are sensors that are within the upright bucky and the table bucky that are going to figure out what size cassette you have inside that particular bucky and it will send a signal to the collimator housing to close the shutters automatically to that field size. PBL is activated, collimators automatically adjusted so the radiation field size matches the size of the image receptor. That also must be within 2%. Aperture diaphragm is basically a flat piece of lead with a hole cut in it. So basically any size hole, as long as it's cut inside that kind of lead, that's considered an aperture diaphragm. Now with these ones you have uh, circular metal tubes that connect to the tube housing. These are forms of cones so that can produce circular kind of collimation which you probably haven't seen all that much. This is not used in this day all that much but what happens is that this will actually attach the collimator housing and so based on the SID this opening here will be either large or small depending on how far away it is from the patient on there. It's pretty good usage for things like head work like sinuses, um, nasal bones, TMJs, those types of things that we would use it but you normally don't see that that often. Filtration. Basic purpose of filtration is to reduce exposure to the patient's skin and superficial tissue by absorbing most of the lower energy photons from the beam. So what we have is these soft or low energy that kind of have these long wavelengths that are enough to get out of the tube and kind of travel out. But what fil uh, filtration does is it picks that off before it reaches the patient and just basically drives up dose because these long wavelength uh, soft x-rays aren't enough to get through the patient's skin and actually get through to the IR on the other side of the patient. This increases the quality or mean energy of the x-ray beam so by taking out this kind of soft long waves this uh, causes a stronger higher energy uh, focused radiation coming out of the tube. Types of filtration there's two types inherent and added. Um, inherent includes the glass envelope encasing the tube, insulating oil, glass windows, all the physical parts across on there um, before you get to the collimating housing is considered the inherent um, filtration. Added includes sheets of aluminum appropriate thickness. There are different aluminum thicknesses that you can use in some of the older tubes. There's actually a circular disc between the collimator housing and the x-ray tube that you can adjust that a little bit. Uh, most people pretty much leave it alone or leave it on one setting uh, but inherent plus added is going to equal your total filtration. Compensating filters um, different thicknesses uh, throughout the body when we're talking about things like the T-spine or the foot, um, sometimes the ribs. Uh, a lot of times compensating filters can be used to kind of even out the image so you don't have a particular dark area over here and a particular light area where it's a little bit thicker. So what you can do is you can use these type of filters, a wedge filter or a bilateral wedge or trough going across and that's going to kind of even things out a little bit. And generally you want to put that thicker part across where the actual parts are a little bit thinner. So you'll put this thicker part over the toes, thinner part over the foot. So as the x-rays come out, it's got to penetrate through here and it's going to kind of, I would say, alter it a little bit so that you get a little bit more uniform density going throughout. Um, like I said, the T-spine, the foot, um, some of the ribs and the areas you mostly see them. Um, you can uh, occasionally use like a poor man's filter if you don't have one of these that attaches to the column in your head you may have seen a tech or two put a saline bag over the chest and what you'll notice is that the saline bag does the pr approximately the same thing so as the chest gets a little bit thinner towards the top more the saline solution will kind of work its way towards the superior portion as opposed to the inferior portion and it'll kind of create that same um, filter going across more and more equipment these days are pretty um, uniform and with the digital applications kind of stitching everything together and kind of evening out the image so that you don't see that quite as much now.
Exposure reproducibility, consistency and output of radiation intensity for identical generator settings from one exposure to the next. Variance of 5% or less is acceptable. So what we have with exposure reproducibility is that if you shoot a chest x-ray at 125 at 3.2 and then for some reason then you see some, I don't know, a necklace across on there and then you shoot it again, that second image shouldn't come out all that different from your first image. So it needs to be consistent from one image to the next. If you get one image that's super light and one image that's super uh, dark or overexposed, then your reproducibility isn't quite there and it's probably past that 5% threshold. Source of skin distance. So for portables, you need at least 30 centimeters or 12 inches is required. You cannot get any closer to that. The only time you would have to really worry about is if you're doing uh, patients in the NICU, um, preemies. So you've got to watch your distance if you have them inside one of those cribs that have kind of a top portion on there that's kind of fixed on top of it. You may have to tell the nurse or attending to, you'll have to switch them to a Mayo stand or a different type of uh, um, crib that you can get a little bit more distance on because you cannot be closer than 12 inches. When the SSD is small, the patient's entrance exposure is significantly greater. So what happens when you're too close to the patient is that you will not have the divergence of the beam to kind of get a larger particular area of the body. So if it's very close to the body, it can only spread out so far. And what you'll have is you'll have more exposure. Uh, by increasing the SSD, the radiographer maintains a more uniform distribution of exposure throughout the patient. So it's basically what I said in my last point. Avoiding overexposure of the patient, dose creep is a phenomenon of using higher techniques so that you can manipulate your images to more ideal ranges. Avoiding possible repeats is not justified by overrating your patients. This is both unethical and unacceptable. So with dose creep, you see this more and more because techs will say things like, well, it's better to burn than return when they're doing portables, or they just want to blast through the lower portion of the C-spine and make sure seven's on there. It's not okay to over-irradiate your patient at any particular point. Um, you want to make sure that you are giving the proper amount of dosage to get the anatomy that you need to see on there. Um, if your images tend to be underexposed every once in a while, that's not a big deal, as opposed to the techs that are using higher techniques to overexpose every single one of their images because now the mean dose for the general population is increasing simply because the tech is not even trying to get into ideal ranges. And that's where you need to pay attention to your S numbers or your EXI exposure ranges, those types of things on there. So if you don't get it, don't worry, but alter your techniques for the next patient that's the same size, same age, same thickness, so that you are not um, overrating your patients. Thoroscopy procedures produce the greatest patient radiation exposure rate in diagnostic radiology. The reason for that is because it's live beam x-ray and it stays on. The amount of time is much higher obviously. Uh, generally the KVP settings are a little bit higher as well, usually in the 90 to 120 range uh, because of the presence of barium. Intermittent or pulse photos should be used to decrease dose and extend the life of the tube. Some doctors like it, some doctors are pretty unaware that it even exists, so you know, if you can, you should talk to your doctors or radiologists, whoever you happen to be working with, and ask them if intermittent foro is okay, uh, or the pulse setting on there, which will take, you know, a little bit more time to pop up on the screen instead of being instant, but once it's on there, then it kind of pulses across there and actually decreases the amount of exposure, not only to the patient, but to the operators as well. To limit the field sizes for cleaner images with fluoro, um, generally if you cone off some of the soft tissue and stick to the main portions like the large intestine, for instance, then you can get much cleaner images. Um, fluoroscopy, not only for that, but also for C-arm procedures that also produce fluoro. Um, things like the lateral hip x-rays that you'll be doing, um, or pinnings or replacements on there, you can actually um, use the shutters to decrease it side to side so that it's not quite as much exposure. Um, SSD fixed plural, no less than 15 inches, mobile, same 12 inches. Cumulative timer must be used, uh, resettable every five minutes. Now, if you look through this, it has a couple other points on here, We're running out of a little bit of time. So this covers basically um, chapter 11, um, equipment design and protection.
If you have any questions about anything, feel free to email me and I'll clear those up for you.